How you doing? Miss Terry and I'd like to welcome all of you here to Fletcher Worship Center for Sunday worship service. Um, we dodged a bullet this week with the hurricane that came in north of us, but Lord God, it, it did do a lot of damage down in Florida and some here in South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and on up. But Lord God, we just uh, pray for all the ones, and we will here in a little bit, we'll pray for all the ones who were had their homes and stuff just washed out from under them, and we pray for the families of the ones who lost loved ones down there. But I want to look at this first slide here before we get started with the message and everything else. It says, and this is R.C. Sproul that says this. Actually, God said it, but we're going to use what the quote of R.C. here. It says, suppose 10 people sin and sin equally. Suppose God punishes five of them and is merciful to the other five. Is this injustice? No. In this situation, five people get justice and five get mercy. No one gets injustice. God is not obliged to retreat all people equally. We must remember that mercy is always voluntary. God said, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And that ties in really big with the message today, the final message on Jonah, is he, he did not believe that the Ninevites deserved God's mercy. He knew that if he preached to them and preached repentance to them, that they would repent and God would be merciful to them. And he didn't want that. He was fighting against that. His whole, his whole being was against that happening. Let's go to the next, next slide, Ms. Terry. Now, this is a prayer slide. It says, in the end, it's more dangerous to bow to the world than to stand alone for God. And that's the truth. We all need to understand that, that we cannot bow down and kowtow to what the world wants. Sadly, too many churches are, are following that lead. They're wanting to be accepted by the world. Well, I would much rather be done away with by the world, but God accept me. But too many people want to be liked, and that's, that's a problem we have in all parts of society. We want to be liked by the world, respected and looked up to by the world, but it's God who we should be worried about what he thinks about us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your mercy on us this week that when Ian came through that he didn't do a lot of damage and we, we hadn't heard about a big loss of life in anywhere but Florida. And Lord God, you talk to us through all the things that you do, the fires, the, the storms, different things that go on. You talking to us, you're telling us we need to turn to you in repentance. We need to, this nation of lost people needs to turn to you in repentance and cry out in your name and ask forgiveness for their sins and forgiveness of the sins of this nation. A nation who kills babies in the womb can never expect to be blessed by God because that goes against everything that's in his word. There's nowhere in his word that sacrificing babies on the altar of Baal is acceptable. Lord God, we just lift them up to you. We lift this nation up to you. We lift all the students at Fletcher up to you, Lord. We lift everyone up to you that will hear and see this message to know that your mercy is undeserved. None of us are worthy of your mercy. None of us are worthy of being saved through the shed blood of Christ. But it's because of your grace that we, we have an opportunity to be saved, to be redeemed, to be in an unbreakable relationship with God the Father in heaven. All these things are undeserved. If we did one thing to deserve it, we couldn't stop bragging to you when we got to heaven. But Lord God, we thank you for your blessings. We continue to pray for the students and staff here at Plessy. We, we pray that they do well in their studies. And we pray that they do the things that they need to do to be successful. We lift them up to you, Lord, for your and of protection. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. The, the message today is on uh, 
the last chapter of Jonah, chapter four. God will give you rest. Well, I didn't have a, I didn't want to use the big fish. I used the other uh, two two times ago because we're past that. But God gave you rest. That that kind of apropos for Jonah and his uh, response to what God did in Nineveh. Well, let's just review the last three messages real quickly. In the first first message, God called on Jonah and said, listen, I want you to go to that great wicked city Nineveh and preach repentance to them and tell them if they don't repent in 40 days, I'm going to destroy them. Well, Jonah knew that God was a gracious God and that if they repented, he would forgive them. Well, the, the Ninevites, the Assyri Assyrians, they were some cruel, wicked people. They did some horrible things to Hebrews, to the Jews, and to people in general. I mean, we won't go into all the things that they did, the way they mistreated people, and just the vile things they did. We won't go into that. But he got on the ship going to Tarsus, and God prepared a great wind. Once he got on the ship and they got out to sea, he pre prepared a great wind and it ultimately what happened was the sailors threw uh, uh, Jonah into the sea and the, those sailors cried out to God to not hold Jonah's blood against them and they sacrificed to Yahweh, they sacrificed to Jonah's God and they worshiped. So that first bunch that he didn't want to, he didn't want to witness to any pagans, any, any of the ones who were unbelievers who were not Jewish, well he just rescued a whole boatload of them with his message. So God prepared a big fish. The big fish swallowed Jonah. And we, we said last when we talked about this that Jonah did not go into the fish alive. He was dead when he went in. He had drowned in the in the sea. The great the big fish rescued Jonah out of the depths, rescued his body, but he was dead. Not for all intents and purposes, he was, he was technically, he was actually dead because if anybody knows how a fish operates, you can't be in his mouth and, not, and live because water constantly coming in and going across his gills to give him oxygen. That was not going to be a healthy thing for Jonah, so he, he was in the big fish's digestive tract. Well, his spirit calls out to God, his, calls out to God for rescue. God has the big fish vomit him out on the shore of Nineveh. And he starts walking. It's a three days journey across the city. And coming out of the fish after three days, he was a sight. But he got it, he, he was resurrected or raised from the dead so he could continue on with the mission that God had given him to do. God was not going to relent and, and give it to somebody else. He gave it to Jonah to do, to preach to that city preach repentance, and he was going to do it. So he raised him from the dead, and he sent him on, but he was a sight. And we talked about it uh, last week. Anytime you ever clean a fish and he's had something in his digestive tract for a little while, that is a kind of, well, it'd be an attention get if you saw that same thing walking down the street. And that was the way uh, he was. Well, he preached his message to the Ninevites and the Ninevites, just as he said, they they believed. But let's let's look at uh, look at Jonah himself. You know, Jonah is a prophet of God. He had some real issues with being joyful in obedience. He obeyed God finally and preached to Nineveh. He preached the message, and the message was so powerful that it spread far and wide, farther than Jonah could have ever taken it. And the king put out a proclamation that everyone would fast and sit in sackcloth and ashes and all these things. So the message of God was powerful, even though Jonah didn't want it to be powerful. He wanted it to be lukewarm. He wanted to preach like God told him, but he didn't want anybody to respond to the, to the call. But, you know, Jonah, more than being a prophet of God, he was more like a spoiled brat. When he doesn't get his way, he kicks the dirt, picks up his ball, and walks away. That's the way Jonah was acting, because the people responded to his message. They responded to the proclamation of the king. They responded to all these things 
And God remained and did not destroy them at that time. But the biggest application from Jonah, I believe, is that if God wants to display grace to someone, that's what's that to us? In Exodus 33, 19, and then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It, what is it to us if God shows his grace, compassion on someone else? How does it diminish what he's done for us? Not at all. It never does. How in the world do we base what, what we feel about other people or what God has done for us? And what if we're, we've been following God all along, but our life has not been a, a bowl of cherries or bed of roses or anything you want to come up with? What if that's the case? And then you see somebody else it seems like their life is blessed. Well, all of us who are in Christ are blessed. We may not feel blessed on this side of eternity, but we're blessed because we have a place, a guaranteed slot in heaven that we're going to be with God the Father. We're going to be with, with the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to be with the Holy Spirit in heaven. That, that's a given if we trust in Christ. But if we don't, then that's a different matter. But Jonah never stopped wanting the Lord to destroy 120,000 people, not to mention all they had, because if when God goes in to destroy the people, he doesn't mess around. He, he just talked to the ones of Sodom and Gomorrah. When he went in there, he destroyed everything. You can't even find where that was. We just have an idea of where it might have been. But the Lord kept throwing to Jonah, but Jonah kept fumbling the ball or fumbling the point about what God wanted him to do. Except for actually sharing the gospel, we really have no part in whether someone gets saved or not. We don't. All we can do is be the, the messenger. We can share the gospel with somebody, but we can't save them. All we can do is point them to Jesus, the one who can save. If the Holy Spirit doesn't convict the unbeliever of their sinful nature, they will never be saved. Jesus says in Matthew 12, 31, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Well, the blasphemy against the Spirit is when you, the Pharisees told Jesus that he was healing through the power of the devil. But when we deny and I've had people do it to me. They don't believe in the Holy Spirit. They kind of believe in Jesus. But Jesus believed in the Holy Spirit. Because he said, when I, when I leave, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. And the Holy Spirit will indwell the believer. So Jesus believed. So if we believe in Jesus and we follow Jesus, then we're, we're falling down our job if we don't believe in the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's what he's Jesus was talking about if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit by denying his power, denying what he, who he is and what he is, if you deny that, then you can have a head knowledge of Jesus all you want to. You can believe God all you want to, but if you're denying the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, you're going to remain in your lost state. That was the unforgivable sin because if you never trust and that God the Holy Spirit, when he convicts you of your sinful nature, if you don't trust in that, then there's no way you can be saved. But anyone failing to believe in the truth of what Jesus did on the cross will, will fall into this category. If we are not convicted of our sin, then there will be no repentance. No repentance leads to no justification in Christ and eternal separation from God the Father. Now, as we get to Jonah Chapter 3, verse 10, looking back, it says, Then God saw their works, talking about the Ninevites, that they had turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did so. Now, their, their repentance 
must not be seen as them becoming ex exclusive followers of the God of the Bible, the God of Jonah. They believed what Jonah was preaching from Yahweh, but they were not going to become practicing Hebrews. That's not what, what this was about. What he was trying to get the, the Ninevites, the Syrians to, to see is to, to repent and turn from their wicked way. And if they turn from the wickedness, they did, that doesn't make them saved. There's not a whole bunch of Ninevites that are in heaven because of this. But what happened was when they turned from the evil they were doing, that didn't save them other than save them from the destruction that God was going to bring along. And if we look next week at the message next week, we're going to see how long that lasted. But the, the Ninevites, they were polytheists. They tried everything else. So, so why not Jonah's God? They were spared for a time. And Jonah must have been some preacher to get 120,000 people plus all they had to repent. Noah, Noah preached 120 years and the only people saved were him and his family. Jonah served a good God who would see the hearts of men. He could see the hearts of men that they believed and they, they repented and they turned from the evil they were doing. But just, just as, as scripture says, uh, God doesn't have any grandchildren. The same thing with the Ninevites. When they turned and believed, repented and believed, that didn't, it didn't carry on forever. But this is what exactly what Jonah was afraid of. This is what he, he knew would happen. He knew they would repent. He knew they would turn. And what happens is we look at people and we say, well, they need to pay for all they've done. I'm telling you, the Apostle Paul is a perfect example. As Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of the church, the persecutor of Jesus Christ, the one who drug Christians off, in chains and put him in prison and some were killed when he entered into heaven he was cheered by those he had martyred, those he had drug off those who had been killed because of the work he was doing against Christ because he had been redeemed by Christ they were glorious to see him, they praised him they had, and, you know, and that's what the gospel is about that's what all this is about. It's what Jesus is about. No matter what you've done, it's what your relationship with Jesus Christ is. Are you washed in the blood? Are you twice born? Are you redeemed by his shed blood? Or is he just somebody you know about and don't really have that much to do with? Verse 4 1 of Jonah says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. Remember what I said a minute ago? He was like a petulant child that when things didn't go his way in the game, he kicked the dirt, picked up his ball, and he left. And that's, that's what Jonah was doing. That's because he knew God was going to be faithful and forgive these people, or he's going to, at least going to postpone their destruction. But he reluctantly did as the Lord God commanded. So did he have a, But did he have a reason to be angry? Did he really have a reason to be angry? I don't think so. I don't think he had a bit of reason. It's like that first slide. If God decides to show mercy on somebody, and then on another, somebody else, he he doesn't show mercy, but he, ha he has no uh, compunction. There's no put on, nothing put on God to make him act what we think is fair. Because what's fair with God is, as that first slide said, is for all ten to go to hell. That's what's fair. That's what's just. But it's undeserved mercy. It's grace on those that didn't go. Remember, he was praying that the people would not repent and that the great I am would destroy them. Do you, we as Christians, get upset when somebody we know is not worthy comes to faith in Christ and is saved? Really, is it up to us who the Lord chooses to save? None of us is worthy absent the shed blood of Christ. 
If we have that attitude, then aren't we like Jonah? If Jesus Christ, the God-man, wants everyone to hear the gospel, then doesn't it seem important to tell all, tell everybody? We, we too often, we pick and choose. Now, I know we can't go to the mall and run up everybody we see and share Jesus with them, but as a, if there's somebody we're supposed to see, and there's always a somebody we're supposed to witness to, that is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit gets their heart ready to hear the message and gets our heart ready to share the message. And that's what we need to be hanging on to and what our responsibility is, what we're supposed to be doing. Verse uh, 4, 2 of Jonah says, So he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. You know, what, 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 what great praise for, uh, for God. What, what great praise this, this little prayer is. So that you're gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. I mean, he's, he's, he's upset. He's still praising God. He's, he's praising God in a way that uh, he's saying, I know all this about you. And because I know all this about you, I know when I preach your message that you're going to be, you're going to let them off the hook. Well, none of us are ever really let off the hook. None of us. And as I was continuing on talking about Paul, the Apostle Paul, look at all the things he had to endure once he came to Christ. He was, he was a persecutor of the church. He came to Christ when Christ met him on the Damascus Road and convicted him and converted him. He spent the rest of his, his life in ministry, but he was stoned, shipwrecked, beaten with rods several times, in prison numerous times. He had all manner of things happen to him, and he was beheaded at the end. So to say someone who is receives God's undeserved mercy is getting off scot-free. We don't know what happened to the Ninevites when God didn't destroy them. They still had to pay the consequences of the sin they had done against the Hebrew people. They would still do it again later on when they had went back to their normal way of operating. But it's the key takeaway from Jonah is it is not our business who God shows mercy to. Jonah knew that knew what would probably happen if he preached repentance in Nineveh. It wasn't that he was such a great preacher, but that he served, but that he served as we do an Almighty God. Do you ever run away from the Lord's call in your life? Do you avoid sharing Jesus just because you know the Holy Spirit is working on him and you don't want to be a part of it? Jonah 4 3 says, Therefore, O Lord, Please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Now what balderdash is the old word. Because God spared these people, John wants his God to take his life. Well, you know he, he's, he doesn't mean it. You know he doesn't mean it at all. He's saying it. But don't we a lot of times say things to God that we don't really mean and that we're glad that he knows what's deep in our heart, sometimes really deep, and he knows what we actually mean when we, we say some of these things? But pretty radical stuff wanting to die because 120,000 people were saved who had been lost. Why would Jonah hold this position? Is there anyone so wicked that we should not want them to turn to Christ in faith and repentance? Let's be fair here. Jonah had been in disobedience to the Lord when he ran from the commission to Nineveh. Jehovah Jireh would have been perfectly in his right to let Jonah just drown when thrown into the sea. 
when his corpse hit the beach, the Lord raised him from the dead and he grudgingly did as he was told. The Lord could have brought deliverance from another and just forgotten Jonah altogether. And as we see in Esther, the Lord will, Lord's will be done. And this is when um, when uh, Esther was queen in Persia and Haman had talked to the king into putting out a proclamation that they could kill all the Jews and take their property. Mordecai sent a message to, to Queen Esther and said, listen, this is what's going to happen. You need to go talk to the king and get this changed. And if, first off the bat, she said, no. So if I go, you know, I haven't been called to be around the king for, for a month. If I go, they'll cut my head off while I walk into the in there into the throne room and I haven't been called well this is what Mordecai said he said for if you remain completely silent this time relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place but you and your father's house will perish you yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for a time such as this so at the end of the discourse on this, what what Esther said was, told him, said, y'all fat and take all the people and fast for three days and me and my maid servants will do the same thing here in the palace and then I'll go, go in there and try to see the king, though he hadn't called me in there. And if I perish, I'll perish. She was laying it all on the line, but just like Jonah, initially, she balked about it. She, she didn't want to do it. But that's a natural response. But uh, Mordecai was right when he said that if she didn't do what, what she could, that deliverance would have come from somewhere else. And it would have, because God was, was preparing the Jews to go back in to, to, to claim the promised land again. But Esther, as Esther responded with hesitation, so did Jonah also. But because we serve a gracious God of second chances, the opportunity to serve was not withdrawn. Now Jonah chapter 4 verse 4 says, Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? No, it wasn't right for him to be angry. And the reason I say it wasn't right for him to be angry, he, he didn't get upset and didn't get over it. He stayed in his anger. And it's the Lord God who is a, the offended party. And we have no justification for anger against anyone. What God, when someone sins, it's against God. It's not against us. Now, sometimes people's actions affect us, and yeah, that's that's bad. But the truth of the matter is, no matter what happens, it's God who's being sinned against. It's God who's being uh, shown disrespect. But we let anger burn in us. Because of the offense we take, not realizing that we have no standing in the matter. There's things that go on in this world, in this country, in this city, in this town, and it can make, it make you angry when, when somebody does something. But really and truly, we're not accomplishing anything. What we're doing is when we get angry, we're taking our mind off of Jesus. The devil uses our anger about something to distract us from what we should be doing. The Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 that it's okay to be angry but not to stay there. In verse 26 he says, be, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath nor give place to the devil. Well, when we, we get angry, there's righteous anger, but righteous anger is not long-endured anger. But when we get mad at somebody or we hold a grudge and we have something against them and we hold it for an extended period of time, we're just giving the devil an opening to come into our lives and mess with us because once we get that way, then, then the devil starts working in your head and telling you things that are ungodly things that you should be doing. And that's why anger is bad if we stay in it. Yes, it, it, it's one thing for something to happen and, 
and go like that and be angry, but you have to get out of it as quick as you can because it doesn't serve God's purpose and it doesn't serve our purpose. Now we said that there, there's righteous anger, but even the Lord himself acted in righteous anger towards the money changers in the temple. Matthew 21, 12 and 13 says, Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have turned, made it a den of thieves. That was righteous anger. Jesus had every right to be angry. But when we read the scripture, he, he didn't stay angry. He did what he, he needed to do. He upset the money changers. He upset the ones selling doves and, and sheep for, for the sacrifice. He, he knocked all that stuff out, and he made his point. That was another reason they were wanting to put him to death, is because he made a good point that the temple was not a place of commerce, but a place of prayer and worship. But he... He did not stay in there. He, he it accomplished what he needed to accomplish, and he moved on from there. And that's the problem, is we'll get angry, and we'll stay in that anger, and it'll fester and fume, and we'll have all manner of problems because of it. No, again, was Jesus angry? You betcha he was. But his righteous anger served his purpose and then that then was no more. We are all human. We're all human. And things make us angry, but it's how we use it and how long we stay under its control. And anger does control us if we stay in it for long enough. Verse 5 of Jonah 4 says, so Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat under it in the shade till he, he might see what would become the city. Now, Jonah's sitting up on the hill. He's got a perfect vantage point to see. He, he's hoping, hoping against hope, that God will not relent and that he will go ahead and destroy the Ninevites. He's just, he's just sitting up there. He's got a ringside seat to watch the carnage. But the carnage never comes because they all repent. All 120,000 repent. Their animals, they cover them in sackcloth and ashes and don't feed or give them anything to drink just, just for the purpose of getting God to relent and not destroy the city. But because they did destroy it, Jonah stomps off in a snit, hoping that the Lord will, will destroy another one. He builds for himself a crude shelter to protect him from the elements, so his call to die rings hollow. If he was wanting to die, he wouldn't worry about being exposed to the sun and, and the, or whatever the weather was, but he made himself a shelter. That's, that's not uh, someone who wants to die. But still hoping against hope that the Lord would not relent, Jonah would have a front row seat to the carnage. That's like going to NASCAR race only to see the wrecks. Now Jonah 4 and 6 says, Now the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might shade, be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. God prepared five things in the book of Jonah. He prepared a great storm on the sea, a great fish to pick up Jonah after he was cast overboard, a plant to come up over him to shade him, a worm that we'll touch on here in a minute, and a vehement east wind, which is also something we'll touch on in a minute. But the three of these things are in this chapter. The plant, the worm, the vehement east wind. Everything the Lord prepared was to change the prophet's attitudes toward the Ninevites. So many times we let things that don't affect us distract us from the truth and grace of God. Satan uses this tendency against the believer trying to short-circuit the work of the cross and the empty tomb. The Lord is... 
Jonah was grateful to the plant for the shade, but not to the one who prepared it. The Lord is good about giving us blessings that we have not labored over. And we look at Joshua 24, 13. Yahweh tells Joshua, I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities which you did not build, and you dwell and you dwell in them, you eat of the vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides, is good about blessing us, but we are sorely lacking in gratitude. When we are down, we cry out as Jonah did when he was cast into the sea. How often do we just take time to thank the Lord for his provision in our life? Jonah 4 and 7 says, But the morning dawned the next day. God prepared a worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. Now Jonah was grateful for the plant which he which was provided as unearned grace. In fact, all grace is unearned because if we we could do anything to earn it, God would get an air flow from us. The Lord literally provided the plant for Jonah's comfort just as he prepared the worm that destroyed him. It was his call, and Jonah's only part in the deal was benefiting from the shade it provided. Now Jonah 4.8 says, And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement wind, east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Jonah Absent any gratitude is back to calling for the Lord to just kill him. Did you notice that in this whole book, Jonah asked for death, but not to the point of doing anything himself? As above, his cry for death kind of rings hollow and is more about us, more a statement of aggressive aggravation with God. In Jonah 4, 9 through 11, then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plan? And Jonah said, it is right for me to be angry, even to death. But the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between the right hand and the left and much livestock? God was looking at the big picture because that's what God does. He sees the big picture. He sees the beginning and the end of everything. But we, on the other hand, we just see that little bit of stuff that's right in front of us. We can't, we can't pick out the eternal things, not on this side of eternity. But Jonah was having a trouble breaking the simple code of God, which is the gospel of Christ. Christ Jesus, the God-man, wants all to be saved through repentance and the indwelling Holy Spirit. Jonah's mistake was the same one we make daily. We decide by our inaction and failure to share the word of God with the lost and dying world. Peter questioned the Lord about John not dying before he comes Again, in uh, John 21, 23. And his answer, or John 21, 20 and 30 is his answer. It says, uh, Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, following who also had leaned on his breast at the supper, and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, But Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then this saying went out among the brethren that the disciple would not die. Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but I will, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? The key in this whole whole. Uh, narrative here this discourse is what jesus says at the end what is that to you whatever god does 
whatever grace he bestows on somebody, whatever justice he bestows on somebody, what is that to you? What is that to me? It's what we do in Christ. It's the, the, the grace and justice that he, he gives us. That's important. But we can't look at another person and see what they, what they appear to have and make a judgment call about they're deserving of, of wrath or they're not deserving of wrath or, you know, what is it to us? It's not our call. It's not our problem. We have enough problems of our own just trying to stay in the will of God as much as we can on a daily basis. And yes, we all fail. We all sin because we're, we're, we have the sin nature that we inherited from our daddy Adam. But still, what is it to us what God chooses to do with another. Jesus tells his disciples and us that who is saved is not our call but his. What God chooses to do with his creation is way above our pay grade. What is it that what is that to us anyway? We are not arbiters of God's grace. We who are saved are barely making it over the wall. For those of us who don't understand what's happening to our nation and culture, we only have to look back. Jonah preached repentance to Nineveh in the 8th century B.C., and they responded, being spared destruction. Fast forward about 100 years to the 7th century B.C., and another prophet of God, Nahum, who we will look at next Sunday, preached to the once again great wicked city. The lesson of Jonah has been forgotten. We are always a generation away from complete depravity as a society if we do not keep reinforcing biblical standards, biblical values. The Lord used the Assyrians to discipline the wicked northern kingdom of Israel. But though he uses the wicked to discipline his chosen people, he doesn't forget the evil done to them. His wrath will always fall on those who curse his people, Israel, and his church. So take heart. God's still on the throne. God's in control. Jesus is coming back for the church. But more than that, he's coming back for the second advent. When he comes back, then all accounts will be settled. Let's go to the prayer side, Mr. Terry. God's will is found in God's word. Stop looking for a sign. Start looking for a verse. And that's too many people are, are looking at too many things and call them signs of the end time. I know when the end time is, it's when God the Father tells God the Son, go get my children. That's as, that is as uh, precise as I can be about it because God's Word says that. But we need to understand that it's in God's time, not our time. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for your blessings. We thank you for your message today. We thank you and we pray that this message is uh, is uplifting to some people because it, it demonstrates what your grace and power is all about. And we, we often devalue what you do in our lives. We, we take credit for things. And that's why, why we can't do anything to be saved because if we could do anything at all to be saved, all we would be doing was claiming credit for it and taking your glory away. When we, when we get to heaven, those of us who, who love Jesus and who are twice born blood washed, who have been redeemed by the blood, the cross, and the empty tomb, those of us, when we get to heaven, all we can say, we, we did make it in. Said, I skipped my belly on the wall going over, but we made it in. And Lord God, we pray for the students here at Flatsy again, but we... We want to pray for the people down in Florida before we close out. We want to pray for them. Ian came through and did a, just treated them badly down there. And Lord God, there was so much destruction. We don't know how many. The last I heard, Miss Terry told me, I think it was 77 or 77 plus people who had died, lost their life down there. They're still looking through the rubble and debris. But Lord God, we know that you talk to us through the weather. You talk to us through the things that are going on in the world. But we're just not listening. We're not paying you the, the attention 
we're not giving you the glory that you deserve for being the creator God who, who made all of this and when I hear when I hear these uh, other people talk about well, mother nature dealt us a blow I, they need to quit calling on mother nature and start listening to father God because father God's the one who has the answer mother nature is just an idol that people worship because they don't want to turn and give credit to you. You're the one. You're the creator, God. You're the one who created all this. You're the one who can take a, a, a finger and direct the storm where you want it to go. Lord God, we thank you that it skipped, skipped ahead of Charleston a little bit this week. But Lord God, it, when it moved from Charleston, it moved around closer to somebody else. And Lord God, we just pray for everybody who's been impacted by this storm. And we pray that we don't have any more like this this year or ever again but lord god we thank you for your blessings we thank you for your message we thank you for all the work miss terry did for the service today and we thank everyone who whoever has come through this this uh, ministry and we 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 start in our eighth year today or this month and we've had so many godly people who come through here people who who loved the Lord, who, who come to worship, who were faithful to come, who we're still in contact with. Who we, we, we love each and every one of them. We, we, we were sad to see them go, but we know they had to go home. But we, uh, we're so thankful for the ones we still communicate with over the internet. But Lord God, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for all you do. And it's in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.